Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. We exist to lead unchurched people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We are a people, not a place, and are sent to make a difference in our world. Clear Creek gathers for worship online and across multiple campuses in the Bay Area of Houston. For more information, visit us at clearcreek.org. Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. We hope that today will be one more step in you exploring faith in Jesus, growing in community, and joining us to make a difference in our world. Before we jump in, you should know, uh, more than providing online content, we want to connect with you in community. We hope that today would be a preview of who we are as a church family and that uh, you would connect with us at one of our five campuses in the Houston Bay Area real soon. Or connect with us online at clearcreek.org where you can find information about our locations and worship service times. It's also a place where you can find details on how we serve in community, how we grow in small group, how to give online or find upcoming events and resources. Look. Wherever you are today, we are glad you're engaging with us. If you're encouraged uh, today or challenged in some way, share a link to this video with a friend or someone you think really needs to see it. We're glad you're here. Well, here we go again. It's Christmas season. It has begun. Black Friday has already happened. It's not as crazy as it used to be, but we can all rest assured that someone somewhere got beat up at Walmart. We know that that is the, uh, the unofficial start of the Christmas season when someone gets beaten up at Walmart. And so now we can hang up our Christmas decorations. We can start playing Christmas music. It's that uh, most wonderful time of year. You start thinking about it. What's interesting about Christmas, which makes it really unique, it is the only Christian holiday that is also a major secular holiday. It's one of those holidays that, you know, people from really different faith backgrounds, different religions, maybe even no religious affiliation still celebrate Christmas all around the world in America. Because, I mean, who doesn't like decorating Christmas trees and getting presents and Santa and elf and, and reindeers? And so really, no, no matter where you go, you still see the, the Christian roots of the Christmas holiday. You go to any store, you'll hear distinctly Christian music being played, you know, whether it's instrumental or you actually hear the words being played in there. And even though it's mixed in with weird songs like grandma got run over by a reindeer, like they're still there. So you have millions of people all over the world, millions of people, uh, even within our own city, in our own area, who observe the, the same holiday, but yet they're celebrating two radically different things. And there's a divide there. We might be doing similar things for our our Christmas celebration, but there is a difference. People who maybe they wouldn't consider themselves religious or consider themselves Christians, they would be offended by the suggestion that Jesus would be the center of our Christmas celebration. Likewise, Christians are troubled by the the meaning of Christmas being trampled by this over excess and over commercialization of, of everything that has to do with Christmas. Now, I love Christmas. I love the lights. I love the, the smells. And I love all the, the food that you eat, all the, the special drinks that you have at this time of year. I love that, that this is the time of year when people, that no matter what they believe, that they have the emphasis and the desire to be generous towards good causes. They have a desire to gather around with family and loved ones. Like those are good things for everyone. And so the question is, as followers of Jesus, how can we truly enjoy all the festivities and the food and the gift giving and not forget the true meaning of the day. Because it seems to me that, that Christians should be the ones who are able to, to best celebrate Christmas this season because we understand both the history that it celebrates and also the promise that it holds, which is why every year as we approach Christmas, we take a season to celebrate Advent. Advent is that season where we are anticipating the arrival or the advent of Jesus and his birth at, in, in Bethlehem, but also anticipating his second advent, his second arrival when he says he's going to return and he's going to restore all things and make all things new. And so each week, as we get closer and closer to Christmas, we're going to focus on the different themes of Advent, hope, love, joy, and peace. Because when we remember and we embrace these different themes of the Advent season, we 
more fully celebrate Christmas because it's rooted in worship and gratitude. So as we begin this Advent season, we begin with the theme of hope, the theme of hope. And when you think about it, the main reason that, that people who celebrate Christmas observe and celebrate two radically different things is because they have two radically different understandings of hope. And it's not that we hope for different things because we have a very common thing, things that we, that we do hope for. Everyone hopes for justice and for peace in the world. Everyone hopes to be loved and needed. Everyone has this desire to, to see joy and, and peace be spread out through our world, to have different material things that we desire for ourselves, to have meaning and purpose in our life now, but also to know that everything mattered when our life is over. And so the difference is not in what we hope for, but the difference is found in how we believe that hope will be realized. It's how we answer the question, who is going to accomplish justice and peace in the world? Who is going to give me the, the love that I desire? Who's going to be my provider of the material things that I want or I need? Who's going to be the one who gives me my purpose for living? And that question is answered in very different ways. See, people who wouldn't consider themselves a follower of Jesus, maybe someone who, who celebrates the more secular version of Christmas, they believe that it's up to them oftentimes to have those things, those things that we all commonly hope for. They believe they must be in control of, of getting what they want out of life. And so their hope depends on themselves and their ability to, to work hard and control whatever circumstances or people that they can so that they can get what we all hope for. And so they hope in themselves, which is the reason why Christmas is not so celebratory for many people. I mean, the reason why for some it is a dreaded season that they walk into is because the Christmas season only intensifies the efforts of many people to get what they want out of life, but they don't have. And the grasp for ways to try and gain control. They want so badly to give their family the kind of Christmas that they think that everybody else has. And so they end up spending more than they really should spend. And then they find themselves in a pile of debt in January or they want so badly to have the relationships or the family that, that they don't have instead of feeling disconnected or, or even lonely, which leads to sadness and depression because it's not the kind of relationships, the kind of family that they had always pictured. And so the Christmas lights and the, the peppermint mochas and the Lexus commercials and the images of the happy families only highlight the gap between who they are and where they are and who and where they want to be. For many people, Christmas isn't so much about hope as it is about disappointment. So this week, I put up our, our Christmas lights, or at least I'm in the process of doing that right now. It's always a fun time. The kids want to get involved. We turn on Christmas music in the garage so we can hear it out in the front. I climb up in the attic, and I get down all the big plastic bins and tubs that I put away 11 months ago. When I opened up the tub this year, I don't remember what was going on 11 months ago, but I must have been in a hurry or in a really bad place because it was all a mess. Like it was all this jumbled mess of tied up Christmas lights and I'm starting to pull things out and just pulling out bird's nest of, of Christmas lights and I'm working to get it untangled and the more I work, the more I'm getting nowhere. They're all hung up on each other. You know how lights get stuck up on each other and you can't really pull them out smoothly. So the next thing I know that I'm spending minutes, I mean, I'd be 15, 30 minutes just trying to get things untangled. I'm getting frustrated and it's still a tangled mess. And it's one of those things that, the more you're frustrated, the, the faster you're going, the harder you're pulling, and it just makes things worse. And the longer it goes on, the more you begin to, to lose hope that you're ever going to get things untangled, that maybe you should just throw the whole tub away and, and burn your house down. <laughs> but you see, hope dies in the futility of trying to untangle the impossibly knotted lines of, of Christmas lights. And when hope dies, well, man, that's when anger flourishes. When hope dies, anxiety and despair take its place. When hope dies, resignation starts to set in. You start wondering why you even tried in the first place. Christmas confronts us with the, the tangled up, knotted mess that is our lives at times. 
that heightens our awareness of all the, the pleasant things that we know that are out there that we want, but we just don't have ourselves. It confronts us with the reality that, that no matter how hard we try to, to grab and gain control, that there's so much that we cannot control. And hope dies in the futility of, of trying to control th those things that are far beyond us, which is why depression and suicide are on the increase in this time of year. Because when there's no genuine hope, then the celebration of the, the holiday that is supposed to actually celebrate hope only serves to highlight our lack of it. And so your experience of Christmas has everything to do with where you have placed your hope. That's why Christmas is the heralding of, of good news because the, the true story of the Christmas story teaches us that, that hope begins in the untangleable, the, the messed up life of, of the knots that we have in our own lives. The, the Bible tells the, the true story of hope for hopeless people. So this morning, I want us to look at an Old Testament passage from long ago, written by the prophet Isaiah, about 700 years before the Christmas story in Bethlehem, but it has everything to do with the hope that this one who was born was going to bring. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Isaiah chapter 11. But first, let me give you a little background. So the Old Test whole Old Testament story is telling the story of, of God's people, the people of Israel, how, get, how God makes a, a covenant with them. He makes a, a relationship with them, that he is going to be their God, and, he, and they're going to be his people. He's going to bless them, and he's going to protect them and provide for them. And not only would he bless them, but he would also bless the whole world through them. But this promise, this covenantal relationship between God and his people is contingent on one thing. It's contingent on them trusting God. They had to believe that he is good, that he is in control, and that in his goodness and his love towards them, that he would lead them. He would be God, they would be his people, and not the other way around. But you see, Israel constantly, throughout their history, pushed back against this arrangement that God had made with them. I mean, they for sure wanted God's protection and provision and blessing, but they just didn't want to rely on him to provide it. And so they insisted on receiving God's kindness, but yet they rejected his control. And as part of that rejection, they worshiped many different pagan gods. And the reason why is simply that a, a pagan god is a god that you can control. That's what made it so appealing for them. Right? You do what you're supposed to do, and supposedly this pagan god is going to do what it's supposed to do, or at least that's the illusion of it. And so the people of Israel have been had settled for this illusion of control and as a result had experienced all kinds of horrific consequences. They had rejected God and as a result they were conquered and enslaved and impoverished. And for hundreds of years, the people of, of Israel had languished in suffering and punishment. Generations came and went never having really known God's provision, his blessing, his promises. They were hopeless. They were the a people who were no strangers to the feeling of, of hopelessness. In fact, they were the, the poster children for hopelessness because so many things that were supposed to go right for them didn't go right at all as a result of their own actions. So that's the context of Isaiah 11. That's the situation that he's writing to God's people into. So this is what Isaiah 11, starting in verse 1, says. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So let's just stop there. So this sounds a little bit cryptic, but it's loaded with a whole bunch of meaning. So first off, Jesse, you might know, is the, the father of King David, okay, the, the great king from generations before. It's a way of uh, Isaiah referring to just the people of Israel. This is, the, this is who he's talking about. But what's surprising here in this passage is that the, the people of God, Israel, went from being referred to as his beloved people to now they're called a stump. Now, in their arrogance and their rejection from God, of God, they, they had built themselves up as this mighty, strong force of tall trees reaching to the heavens. So that's how they pictured themselves. But God says that they are now cut down because they have rejected him. And so this stump is a symbol of all the things that were supposed to be but now aren't. It's a monument to this big, beautiful tree that is no more. You see, as a result of their rejection of God, they're, 
They're in the midst of being conquered by some surrounding empires who are encroaching now upon them, and so they have no escape. They have no options. They're going to be wiped out and cease to become a nation. They're a stump. They're a picture of hopelessness. But here's, here's what you have to get is that where hope begins is in the hopelessly unsolvable mess of a tangled up life, right? Because there's still, there's still life in the roots of this stump, right? It, it, it's not quite fully dead and gone. God promises that he's gonna bring new life, that out of this, this wasteland, this flattened forest, he's gonna bring a new king out of the, the line of David, the son of Jesse, who's gonna, who's gonna spring up and bear fruit. He's gonna produce now a, a new forest, a, a new people. Let's keep reading Isaiah as he describes what this new king is gonna be like. Isaiah 11, verse two. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So who is this person who's gonna come from the roots of the, the stump of Israel? It says that the spirit of the Lord is gonna be on him, which is a shorthand that the Old Testament used to, to describe the king. Because the king was someone that the, the spirit would be upon. And he's not gonna be like all the other train wreck kings that they had had recently, and especially at this time. But he's going to, to rule with God's character. He's going to be the king who is just and merciful and righteous. He'll have the spirit of, of wisdom and understanding in order to help lead his people. He'll have the spirit of, of counsel and might to protect and win victory for his people. He'll have the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord as he walks in holiness. And when it says fear, it's not fear as in terror, it's fear as in honor and worship, that this wise king will be the, the perfect representation of, of everything that Israel was supposed to be, but they weren't. God's will lived out. And so if you want to understand what Christmas is, is all about, you first have to, to get that, that hope begins in the unsolvable mess of a, of a tangled up life. True hope begins when you come to this realization that you actually don't have hope, or at least you don't have the hope that you thought you did. I mean, that's the message that Isaiah is, is preaching to the people of Israel as he's writing this. He's saying, you blew it. I mean, again, again, and again, and now you're just a stump. You were supposed to be a people who experienced the, the blessings of, of hope, and that you were going to be able to share that with the world around you, but, but now you don't realize that at all because you didn't actually see that hope doesn't belong to you, that true hope doesn't depend on you in the first place. Because sometimes when I read this Old Testament uh, story of Israel, one of the things that always crosses my mind is I always think, gosh, what a bunch of morons. I mean, could they not see what was happening? Could they not read their, their family history and see that, that all of their problems were, were self-inflicted? I mean, time after time after time, God taught them and warned them, and then when they messed up, he punished them, and then he forgave them, and then taught them and warned them and punished them and then forgave them, and this happened over and over and over again because they insisted on trying to do things their own way, of being in control of, of getting what they were hoping for. They thought they could control their circumstances and the people and their politics. And even they sort of twisted their own religion and how they worship God. And time and after time after time, it blew up in their face. And yet time after time after time, they kept insisting on their own control. Now, I shouldn't be too quick to call people morons because I can relate to that. Can't you? I mean, you think about those tangled up Christmas lights. I knew the more impatient I got and the harder I pulled, the worse it was going to get for me. But yet... I kept doing it over and over and over again, hoping that this time would be different. Why? Why do so many people keep doing the same destructive things over and over again, knowing that, that they're still awash in all the negative consequences from the time before? Why go down that path, knowing that, that deep down, that what they're doing is afflicting them with, 
with debt and destroying their relationships and leaving them feeling guilty and ashamed and, and anxious. It's because there and sometimes my functional answer to that question of, of where my hope is found is that it's the same as Israel's. Right? It's the same as Israel's, that it's up to me, that I'm my only hope. You see, Christmas comes and, and rubs our nose in the truth that in spite of all of our efforts, all of our striving and struggling to, to untie the knots of our lives, the, the knots are all still there. And getting impatient and pulling harder only makes things worse. And even if we have some success in some areas or many areas of our life, we discover that all the stuff that we may have still gotten, all the things that we hoped for that now we might have in part, doesn't really satisfy like we thought it would. Right? It doesn't live up to the hype that it's still painful to have broken relationships. No amount of alcohol or entertainment or anything else can erase the memory of the destructive things that we've done or have been done to us. And so we can all relate to, to Israel. So many people insist on believing the lie that if I hope for something, that I must be able to obtain that thing all by myself in my way, in my timing, with my own rules. That's why so many people only celebrate the, the secular version, the secular side of Christmas anyway. It's because there, that's all there is to it. It's Christmas with a little C. That hope is, is the only thing that I can imagine to get, manage to get out of for myself. If I, can just, if I can just get it for myself, then maybe that will satisfy. But we find that that actually is hopelessness. But this is where Isaiah 11 gets really good. Because Isaiah explains why the secular experience and the Christian experience of Christmas are, are radically different, even though we celebrate the same holiday. Listen to what Isaiah says will happen when this wise, righteous king sets up his rule. Verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All right, so we have this really interesting picture here. Isaiah is painting a picture of what the earth will be like when this king comes and his authority is established. And he's describing it as saying that there's going to be this new way in which the whole creation lives together in harmony and peace. No predator and prey relationships, all these natural enemies like wolves and lambs and leopards and goats and cows and bears, that they're just going to hang out together with peace and harmony. No more food chain. You can even let your baby play around with, with venomous snakes. Now, you might think, okay, this is kind of a, a cartoonish picture. Like, it sounds like he's talking about a, a fantasy world. They just make believe, make believe nonsense. But he isn't. But it's clear that, that he's describing something that is unlike anything that's, that's in our world right now. Like, this is not our experience at all. But he's, he's pointing to something in the future. He's pointing for forward to a future time on earth when everything is remade and renewed. He's describing, maybe it's figurative, maybe it's literal, but he's describing what is to come. That, that the new creation is going to be unlike anything else that we can understand. This is what it's going to look like when, when all things have been redeemed. And you see, what we believe about this text and the picture that it paints of the future captures the heart of why there are two radically different ways of celebrating Christmas. Someone who prefers the, the more secular version of Christmas with Jesus isn't on the center can't really even consider the possibility of the day that Isaiah is pointing to. Because everything is now. There, there's a focus on and a commitment to what is happening today. The idea of hope is limited to how can I change my current situation? How can I have the money that I, that I want now? How can I find a, a relationship now? How can I get the things that I want or that I need right now? And so when Christmas is, when that's how Christmas is celebrated, you might enjoy the, the gifts and the parties and the food and the time off. But once December 26 
comes, then now you're looking forward to the next holiday. Now you're looking forward to, to New Year's because it has just as much meaning as Christmas does. That there's fun to be had now because this is all there is. But listen, what every person eventually comes to realize in life is that to hope only in now is actually very hopeless. Because hope is a, is a future word, right? Hope directs our gaze and our hearts towards something that is to come. You can never have everything that you want now because even the things that you have that you think might satisfy you, you realize that you want something different in about 15 minutes. That nothing truly satisfies the cravings of our soul. Deep down, every human being longs for the kind of future that Isaiah is describing here. We're hardwired for it. C.S. Lewis said this, most people, if they really learn to look into their own hearts, would know that they want something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. See, that's why Isaiah isn't pointing us towards something that could somehow make our, our lives perfect now because this world is incapable of satisfying us, which leaves us hoping for more. Because Isaiah isn't pointing us to a king who's gonna come and, and give you some tips on how to improve your life now. I mean, Jesus didn't come for another 700 years after Isaiah wrote these words, and now here we are about 2,000 years or so after Jesus has come, and we're still patiently waiting for God to redeem and restore all things. In fact, if, if Jesus just came to make your life better now, then the Bible would merely just be a glorified self-help manual. But Isaiah isn't describing a king who's going to bring about a, a new king, new kingdom right now. Everything is perfect now, and your life is going to be, you know, glory and flowers and all these different things that you hope for. But he's describing a king who's going to bring about a new beginning that we can't bring for ourselves. And the only way that what Isaiah is describing is going to come about is if God does something dramatic, miraculous, impossible, like to come into his creation as a, as a child born of a virgin, to be born in a, a stable, and to suffer and die on a cross, and to three days later walk out of a tomb. See, a God who can do something like that is a God who can tame leopards and bears and wolves and lions, no problem. See, true hope is not rooted in a wishful thinking attitude or just changing all of your circumstances. But true hope is rooted in the character and the faithfulness of God. True hope is rooted in the character and the faithfulness of God. Listen how the Apostle Paul describes true hope in Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the, redemptions, the redemption of our bodies. So just like Isaiah acknowledged that this world is, is messed up, it's broken, right? There's, there's a groaning that's happening in the world and even within our own hearts. Life is unfair and often unsatisfying. There's a tangled mess going on within our hearts, but we look forward to the day that Isaiah is describing. Paul goes on and says this in verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? Because again, hope is a future thing. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. See, when we really get what Isaiah, what Paul is describing here, all the good traditions and the sentiments that go along with our Christmas, Christmas celebrations make it way more sense for us. That true hope is found in Jesus alone. So as you go into this Christmas season, you have a choice right now. The very beginning of this Advent season, which version of Christmas are you going to celebrate? Are you going to celebrate the, the more secular version that's all about 
you bringing peace and justice into the world, you finding ways that you can provide love in your life, that you finding ways that you can obtain the material things that you want or you need, that, that you determining what your own meaning or purpose is for living? Or will you celebrate the version of Christmas with Jesus at the center, where your hope of all those things is wrapped up in the king who came from the stump of Jesse. See, it's really easy for us to celebrate that other version, to, to get lost in all the, the fun and the Santa and all those different things like that, which are all okay to celebrate, but it's really easy to, to stay at that level, to let that just be the, the depth of, of our Christmas celebration instead of truly understanding what God wants us to get when we start looking at the, the hope that's found in Jesus. See, when we put our faith in Jesus, we decide to to submit to God's control. We learn a a whole new way to live our lives, not based on our own sense of control or illusion of control, but based on God's goodness and his power, on the redemption that, that he gives us in Jesus. And when that happens, that then starts to show up in how we wait for it with patience. See, for some of you, you're here today because God wants you to come face to face with the hopelessness of chasing after lesser gods. That even though we live in a broken world and our lives are a tangled up mess of knots at times, that hope can still be ours. We can still know a a true hope. And God might be speaking directly into your heart so that you know that, that true hope, the hope that you ultimately desire in your heart doesn't require you to to do something. It requires for God to do something. And he has done something in the person and the work of Jesus. And so that new beginning that you long for can be yours through faith by calling out to him and submitting to Jesus as king, trusting him with, with all of your life. And when that happens, when you cry out to him, now you have a different way of of viewing your life and the world around you and a different way of of viewing this Christmas season. Because now you can celebrate Christmas in a new way, knowing that God brings true hope to the hopeless. And so may you celebrate Christmas and the Advent season that leads up to it, embracing the truth that our hope is found in Christ alone. Would you bow with me? Our Father, we are grateful that, uh, that you are God and we are not. That you are our God and we are your people through faith in Jesus. And so, God, I just pray for those in this room who are particularly struggling with this Christmas season as we get closer. Maybe they're feeling hopeless. Maybe they're feeling disconnected from you or de- disconnected from other people. Or they're struggling for whatever reason. God, would you meet them in that struggle? Would you call them to have hope in Jesus? where they cry out to you by faith, trusting in Jesus to be their savior, to be for them what they desire deep down in their hearts? Would you lead them in a a simple acknowledgement of recognizing the, the mess that's in our own lives and calling out to you in faith? And Father God, I just pray for us as a church that as we enter into this Christmas season, that our hearts would be wholly focused on you, that we would see the, the shallowness of the things that are around us that are all, all also within our own hearts and that we would desire to, to bring a depth to it, a, a depth that's focused on the hope and the love and the grace that is found in the gospel. God, our, our desire is to worship you and lift up Jesus in this season. So help us to maintain our focus on you and let us do that with great joy. Let it outshine all the different things that might be offered as ways to celebrate Jesus or celebrate Christmas, but let our celebration of Jesus outshine all those things for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful triumphant Oh come ye Oh come ye to Bethlehem Come and behold Him Born the King of Angels Oh come let us adore Oh come Adore him, oh come let him.
cry.